Before we dive into today's insightful discussion, I want to share some updates that will enhance your FemPower Health experience. We're excited to launch our new interactive newsletter. This weekly newsletter is packed with the latest scientific findings, business insights, and essential updates in the realm of women's health. Signing up is easy. Just visit our website or click the link in the show notes. Our website is also a comprehensive resource organized by topic for your convenience. Whether you're delving into the latest research, exploring any trends in healthcare, or seeking information in specific health topics, it's all there at your fingertips. Additionally, for our Spotify users, we've created playlists categorized by these topics, offering you another way to stay informed and engaged. And for those listening on Apple Podcasts, while we can't categorize content within the app, our website remains a central hub for all of these resources. And be sure to take advantage of these tools to stay on top of the evolving world of women's health, science, and business. Now let's get started with today's episode. This is FemPower Health. Each week, top women's health experts dispel fact from fiction. The most important pelvic floor exercise is not the Kegel. Challenge the status quo. It's It's never easy to challenge the accepted leaders, and especially if you're a woman. Provide perspective on why your healthcare journey may be so tough. All of that fear and worry, it all upregulates our nervous system, puts us into fight or flight mode, and increases our pain sensitivity. And what you can do about it. The number one thing is you have to advocate for yourself, and you have to be prepared. Your journey to get empowered starts now. This is FemPower Health. Each week, top women's health experts dispel fact from fiction. The most important pelvic floor exercise is not the Kegel. Challenge the status quo. It's It's never easy to challenge the accepted leaders, and especially if you're a woman. Provide perspective on why your healthcare journey may be so tough. All of that fear and worry, it all upregulates our nervous system, puts us into fight or flight mode, and increases our pain sensitivity. And what you can do about it. The number one thing is you have to advocate for yourself, and you have to be prepared. Your journey to get empowered starts now. In honor of National Period Day, I decided to create a special episode and I interviewed Dr. Lara Bryden, who is the author of the Period Repair Manual. She published this book right before anyone was comfortable using the word period. And five years later, now everyone's talking about it. However, there's still a lot of information that women don't know, but should. And I could not think of a more ideal person to interview for this special episode than Dr. Bryden. Before we dive into the podcast, I wanted to announce a couple of quick things. One, FemPower Health Podcast is now an Alexa skill. Type in FemPower to find it, or you can go to my Instagram account at FemPower Health, and the link is in the bio. And if you have any feedback for me, I always love to listen to what you all need and desire. So please email me at info at fempower-health. Com. Without further ado, let's start talking to Dr. Lara Bryden. Welcome, Dr. Bryden, to the FemPower Health Podcast. Thanks so much for joining. Hi, Georgie. Thanks for having me. So please introduce yourself. <laughs> Absolutely. So I'm a naturopathic doctor and the author of the book, Period Repair Manual. I'm Canadian, as you can probably hear from my accent, but I live in New Zealand and I spent nearly 20 years practicing in Sydney, Australia. So I have kind of three, I call three countries home. And I've just spent, yeah, the last nearly 25 years of clinical practice on the ground, pretty much nine to five, Monday to Friday, helping women have better periods with diet, supplements, herbal medicines. So I've, I've had an opportunity, which I'm very grateful for, to learn what works and what doesn't work with thousands of women. I reached the point about five or six years ago where I thought I really need to share this information with not just my own patients, but women out there. So that's how the book came into being. The first edition, so it's in its second edition now, came out early 2015. Okay. So I don't know if you remember 2015, but I just have to mention it because um, that was the year of the period. Do you remember it was kind of declared the year of the period? That was the yes. first time there was a lot of kind of mainstream media where they were actually using the word period for the first time, you know, women were talking about it openly in sport. And 
so that, that's only five years ago. It's been a, as you know, the world is changing very quickly, but even yes. five years ago, even back then, when I, in 2014, when I was getting ready to release my book, I had a number, a few people tell me, say to me, I don't know if you should put the word period <gasps> in the title of a book oh, dear. because it's kind of off-putting like back then. So we've come a long way, right? Like, so now 2020, that seems, that's pretty normal to have, to say the word period. That's not a, you know, not taboo anymore. Oh my goodness. I mean, <laughs> it, it really, and now did you write the book before that happened? So it was just amazing timing. Yeah. The, the year, my, my book came out in February, 2015. And by the end of that year, it was declared <laughs> the year of the period, not because of my book, I don't think, but just because of what was happening in the world. So yeah. That is awesome. Awesome. Yeah. So let's talk about periods then, now that we're so comfortable using that word. Yeah. Maybe we could start with some of the myths that women have about periods. I want to start with my, one of my key messages Please. about periods is that ovulation is the main event of the menstrual cycle. The bleed itself is just a secondary downstream effect. I, I think the reason I start with that is because I think we get put so much focus on the bleeding and really it's, it's actually from a health perspective, it's not about that. I mean, we want the bleeding to be as easy and symptom free as possible, but the value of a, a menstrual cycle for women is ovulation, not just to be able to make a baby, of course, that's part of it, but also because ovulation is how women make hormones. So men, men make hormones every day. They have quite a flat you know, pattern with their hormone production. We have this monthly pattern of hormone production, but that is, you know, in, that has been treated as sort of as a liability in some ways that we have this fluctuation through the month. But I like to flip the script and reclaim that as a, it's an asset. It's, we make hormones in this monthly pattern, but we need those hormones, both estrogen and progesterone have many, many benefits beyond just making a baby. For example, there was just in the research mid-September, there was some new bit of research about how having more years of cycles, ovulatory cycles, reproductive years is beneficial for reducing the risk of cardiovascular disease after wow. menopause, you know, years later. So I call this, so one of the things I talk about is every ovulation, every menstrual cycle is like a deposit into the bank account of long-term health. It's building what's called metabolic reserve. It, I mean, most people would know that estrogen makes bones stronger. Progesterone makes bones stronger. Both hormones are good for the heart. Both, both hormones are good for the brain. They affect the microbiome or the gut. They're beneficial for us, just as testosterone is beneficial for men. So this is, this is what it all hinges on. And the, the thing about this is, you can see it's not about the bleed. And the problem is if on hormonal birth control on the pill, we're in this weird situation where there's no ovulation, so no, no hormone production and the contraceptive drugs are not as good as our own hormones. And then we have this monthly induced bleed, which doesn't mean anything. So, you know, there's no reason to have a monthly drug-induced bleed, which is why we get these headlines, these crazy headlines saying things like women don't need periods. They are, oh what that's referring to is women don't need a monthly drug-induced bleed from the pill, which we totally don't. Like there's no, there's no reason to bleed per se if you're not, if it's not part of a cycle with ovulation and making of hormones. Got it. No, that's, yeah. and, I, and I love that you flipped the switch because what also I've been observing in women's health is when it comes to ovulation, people tie it so much to getting pregnant. And even the apps, they're referred to as fertility tracking apps. And I wish that the whole conversation would change to just reproductive health or even women's health. Because even when you say reproductive health, people automatically think yeah. baby. And it all runs together. And that's honestly why I created this podcast, because I, I want women to understand these things. Like it is like women's health is not period ovulation, as no. you mentioned, get pregnant, you have menopause. Like it is, it's a whole system that is a magical system. And it's all, it's not one piece of it, depending on whether or not you want a kid or not. <laughs> Absolutely. 
it's so uh, one way of talking about it might be to speak about ovarian hormones. Ovarian yeah. hormones are beneficial for general health, just as testosterone or you know testicular hormones are important for general health for men. It's not testosterone is not just for making a baby, right? Right. Like, which is actually, it, it seems so obvious when you say it about men, but like, unfortunately, when it comes to women's health, there is kind of this idea. It's like, well, if you're not going to make a baby, do you even really need any of that? Like, do you need those hormones? That's sort of, well, that's, that's definitely what's going on with hormonal birth control because it shuts them down. Um, I recently spoke with the Ovarian Cancer Research Alliance. One of the questions that I had asked them is this very tough position that women seem to be in with birth control because apparently with ovarian cancer, yeah. um, having children is helpful in, yep. I guess you could say preventing it, but also being on birth control. Yeah. Tell me about well, this, Well, anything that, anything that puts the ovaries into dormancy is going to reduce the number of cell divisions happening in that tissue, right? So I've thought about this a lot. So yes, um, hormonal birth control decreases the risk of ovarian cancer, just as, you know, chemical castration of men would probably reduce the risk of testicular cancer, like anything that reduces the activity of that tissue. Right. It, yes. But, but the thing is, you know, in terms of that question, it depends your your history. Like if you have a very strong history of ovarian cancer or something, that's obviously a different conversation. And that's okay. a conversation to have with your doctor. But let's just say your average woman who has no, you know, risk factors specifically for ovarian cancer. Like it's quite a rare cancer compared to other health events that for which the the risk is reduced by having ovulation. So but having active ovaries, having regular ovulatory, ovulate, ovulatory cycles, menstrual cycles, reduces the risk of a number of diseases. I'm going to quote my colleague, Professor Geraldine Pryor, who's a reproductive endocrinologist. If you ever had a chance to get a chance to have her on your podcast, she'd be a great guest. Yep. She's at, um, in Vancouver. She helped me with my book. She, there's a quote from her that I've used, quoted several times. She says quite boldly that 35 years, 35 to 40 years of ovulatory menstrual cycles, regular natural menstruation helps to prevent osteoporosis, dementia, heart disease, and breast cancer. And she puts breast cancer in there because progesterone, the real progesterone we make after ovulation has an anti-breast cancer effect which, and this is a perfect example because the progestin drugs in hormonal birth control that are called progesterone, unfortunately, they, that they're not. Progestins increase the risk of breast cancer. So progesterone lowers the risk of breast cancer and progestins increase the risk of breast cancer. So if we're talking about, you know, all cost benefit, what is the, what is the cost benefit analysis of having regular ovulatory cycles throughout your life? on the beneficial side of the ledger is reduced risk of all those things, including breast cancer, which is obviously a lot more common than ovarian cancer. So that's kind of my short answer to does ovarian cancer reduce, or does the pill reduce the risk of ovarian cancer? Yes. But you know, big picture, there's a lot, there are lots of other considerations. Okay. Back to the birth control then, since you started, or since we started to talk about that, help our listeners understand more about the impact of birth control? Because I know that even in your book, you had referenced that certain types, you know, if you really need them for certain cases are better than others. Okay. Well, let's start with the hormonal IUD. Please. As I guess I would say a better option. So we'll, we'll start with the positive, like okay. know, rather than just bashing the pill. Yes, absolutely. Sh- and and because, I, and I, I, yeah. I, I, yeah. And even in your book, I guess, just to be clear for everyone, yeah. it's not like Dr. Bryden said birth control no. is the worst thing you can ever take. No, but I think it's there. You had definitely strong suggestions around precautions. And so this is about creating awareness so that women have freedom of choice. So, so right. thank you for making, making yeah. sure I clarify so that. Let's start with arguably through my lens, why the hormonal IUD is a bit better. So just to clarify for any of your listeners, I'm sure people, depending on what generation you're in, you know that an IUD is just intrauterine. It's a little plastic device that's done in the doctor's consulting rooms. Like it's, it's not a surgery to have that. You just insert it up to the cervix. It stays in there. 
for a number of years, between three to five years, depending on the type. With, and there's a, there's a non-hormonal type as well, which we'll leave out of this conversation. But the hormonal one contains levonorgestrel. It's a, it's a drug to, um, kind of similar to progesterone, but also actually quite similar to testosterone. So there could be some effects from that. But the advantage of it is that it will, for one thing, it lightens periods quite dramatically. So that can be very welcome effect. Like it, it thins the uterine lining and lightens periods by up to like 90%. So that's definitely something to acknowledge. It prevents pregnancy. It um, does not routinely switch off ovulation. So you can kind of see why from my lens, I prefer that. So I just spent the first 10 minutes talking about how important ovulation is for women, for yep. making hormones, for building long-term health, all of these things. The hormonal AD is quite unique in that it doesn't switch off ovulation. Sometimes it does suppress ovulation to some extent, especially during the first year when the dose of the drug is higher, but right. it's not, that's not how it works. It's working locally in the uterus. So Got it's it. quite unique in that sense in that you can oddly actually with the hormonal IUD is one of the, one of the only times when you can ovulate or cycle, but not bleed, which is very interesting, which is actually the opposite, the complete opposite of what happens on the pill, which is that you bleed, but don't ovulate or cycle. So there are very different sorts of things. So that's an example I guess, you know, all that said, there are downsides, of course, to anything. So I have a blog post on, uh, called The Pros and Cons of the Hormonal IUD, which I've been told is quite balanced. So people can Good. look there and look at all the different, you know, pluses and minuses of that technology. In terms of the other types of hormonal birth control, they're all beyond that. I mean, they all share in common the fact that they do suppress ovulation. The Definitely any combined pill, like an estrogen progestin pill works by suppressing ovulation. The progestin only methods like the implants, the mini pill, the, in well, the injection, actually, I really don't recommend the, in the depo injection for reasons we can get into if you want, but I would say not that, but you know, the other ones, um, the progestin only ones don't, they don't always suppress ovulation, but they usually do. Got so, um, that's through my lens, that's the problem. I mean, then there's the, the side effects of the contraceptive drugs themselves, which varies depending on which drug it is. And, the, you know, they've been linked to mood, hair loss is a big one, you know, mood problems. Um, so we kind of have the layer of, okay, you're, you're being robbed of your own hormones and the, the benefits of ovulation. And then you've, on top of that, you've got potentially the side effects of the progestin drugs, which it's interesting because I was just actually last night having a discussion with my husband about this very topic. Like, you know, is the pill safe? The kind of that, that question, like, is the pill safe? And I think in answer to that, you'd have to say, define safe. Like, is it safe in terms of, you know, severe side effects? Arguably, big picture, probably arguably, yes. Although some women do die of blood clots from hormonal birth control. That's a reality. But big picture, most women do not get anything sinister from hormonal birth control. So from that sense, it's safe. But on the other side of things, like what we're starting to now understand that a number of women experience um, mood changes, if you will, or mood symptoms from contraceptive drugs, potentially can contribute to hair loss, depending on the type. It alters metabolic function. It, it changes the shape of the brain. So these are things we know, like about what those some of what those contraceptive drugs are doing and these are things we're only learning 60 years later right like they they had no idea of any of that back when the pill was approved we're just now starting to kind of think oh how does it like i read a scientific paper they're like okay wait how do these contraceptive drugs affect the brain and also why are we just asking this now like well, yes what? that was actually going to be my question is how yeah. why now <laughs> yeah so it's a more nuanced answer like i i guess in some ways, yes, it's, it's safe. It's been used by hundreds of millions of women over the years, um, but not that long, over 50 or 60, year, 60 years. And in other ways, we've got women who've experienced, for example, depression from the pill, but were not heard when they said that's what was happening, right? Like that's the other part of this conversation is really for generations, women have been saying, oh, this pill affects my mood. And then sometimes the message back to them is, oh, that's just, you're just imagining things. Like, that's not a thing. And 
but it is a thing. So now we know, and we do have some research. There was the big Danish study in 2016, a huge study. It was, it was correlational only, so it didn't prove causation, but they, right. they proved a, a, not a strong, like, but a, a definite link between all types of hormonal birth control, including the hormonal ED, and negative mood outcomes. And even the authors of that study at the time said that was probably an underestimate of the problem because they were only wow. measuring they were only measuring women who actually went on to take antidepressants, not women who and girls who just quietly stopped taking it, right? Like those right. weren't even counted. So it was the women who kept taking it and then ended up on an antidepressant. And that's something I see quite often, especially with younger like teenagers. I might hear a story from a patient. I look, I'm looking at her list of medications and she's on like Yasmin, the pill, and then she's on an antidepressant. I'm like, what order did those come in? Oh, like, okay, that's a good the, question. Yeah, the Yasmin at 15 and then about nine months later, an antidepressant. It's like, hmm. wow. Yeah, I've, I've heard that story before. <laughs> oh, geez. And, you know, it's funny, I, I, you know, there's some doctors that I've interviewed and it's really interesting to just hear how the OBGYNs are trained and it does seem like birth control is, you know, such a solution. So for those, you know, for those of you listening, you know, I wanted to bring this up because I know this is national period day, but I, I wanted to make sure we talked about the birth control because a lot of it is around, you know, the period and ovulation and controlling the cycle and, you know, just really understanding the, the impact of it is, is so critical because, it does seem to be, quote unquote, the magic pill that is used in OBGYN offices for various issues that women have. I mean, you even mentioned in some cases, if you're having a heavy bleed, they'll give it to you. Let's just, part of this is semantics, right? And I know they're just words and words. Yep. No, this is important. Just words, but, but words are actually, words are part of the problem here. I know. So two, two words that we need to get, sort out. Please. <laughs> okay, one, yep. Yeah. The phrase that the pill can regulate, regulate is the word that I'm taking issue with, regulate the menstrual cycle is wrong. Like it, the contraceptive drugs do not regulate anything. They switch off ovarian function and replace, replace it with contraceptive drugs that replace hormones with contraceptive drugs that then because of their dosing induce a drug withdrawal bleed. So that is not regulated. If the menstrual cycle is an ovulatory menstrual cycle where you make right. estrogen and then progesterone and the pill works by completely shutting that down and inducing basically chemical menopause, that's not regulating, right? right? Like, I, I don't disagree with you at yeah, all. <laughs> we could say, like, I'm just thinking of other ways. I think if they spoke to women, like in actually in terms of what's actually happening, it would start to change, you just start to change the whole conversation. It's yep. like, okay, I'm going to give you this. So what more accurately would be like these contraceptive drugs are hopefully going to relieve your symptoms. Okay, so that, yeah, that may be something we can work with and by shutting off your ovaries, um, something like that. I mean, that sounds bad, but that's, that's uh, some women might say, okay, I understand what that means and I still wanna do it and that's fair. Um, keeping in mind that just circling back briefly to the hormonal IUD works differently. So it does lighten periods without switching off the ovaries. So right. that's a different conversation. Yes. The other does. word, yeah, the other word that I want to so regulate cycles is one I'd like to see that change, and the other one is period itself. The word period, I feel, should be reserved for the bleed at the end of a proper natural menstrual cycle. I feel like a pill bleed it just need. Well, I use the word pill bleed. It's a withdrawal bleed. Like with my own patients, when they're talking about what their periods were like on the pill, I say, okay, I just say, okay, well, that's fine. But let's, they were pill bleeds that you were having, you know, drug withdrawal bleed for, you know, every month for 10 years. That's not, those aren't periods. And we can't compare them to what your own periods might be like. It's like apples and oranges. They're completely different things. So yeah, those are my two semantic <laughs> clarifications around what's happening. And, no, and I appreciate that. And this is also why I wanted to interview you because I can tell from even what you put on social media that you're very serious about the information women have and yeah. know about their bodies and really trying to create change. Um, yeah. and I, I so welcome what you yeah. are doing and it is, it is needed. 
FemPower Health is pleased to partner with the upcoming FemTech and Consumer Innovation Summit. The summit is the latest deep dive event, part of the Women's Health Innovation Series, looking to tackle this growing sector of women's health, having had continental success in driving innovation, investment, research, and partnerships in traditional women's health care by bringing together critical stakeholders. Join us in New York on June 7th and 8th as we channel this success into the consumer sector of women's health. Visit www.femtechconsumerinnovation.com to view the superstar speaker lineup and enter code FEMPOWER15 for 15% off your ticket. Hope to see you there. So in the five years since you wrote your book, what would you say some of the changes are that you have seen? Because I know there are these semantics that um, you'd love to change. And it's like one yeah. patient at a time, one person yeah. at a time. But what would you say are some of the great things besides just people talking about it? Maybe we still yeah. have to work on terminology that you're happy to see um, in, in women's health. Yeah, I think, well, the fact that we can say period so easily is a very beneficial, like very positive development. I think also there does seem to be, and maybe I'm just imagining it, but like there does seem to be more of a sense that what women's bodies are doing is a good thing and not, you know, always a liability. It's like with that women's hormones themselves have benefits and right. yeah. So I, I mean, I feel that's part of my key messages. I actually, I mean, not to overstate it, this, this is going to sound a bit extreme when I say it, but I actually feel sorry for men that they're not with, <laughs> that they don't have women's hormones. Like I think estrogen and progesterone are so awesome and, you know, potentially give us so many benefits that, yeah, I guess I, sometimes when I, I talk about it that, and this is true, actually, we are, the female body is the standard version of the, of the, of a mammal body. Like we're all, I don't know if you, if you're, if you know this, but like, we're all, when we're fetuses in utero, we're all female until week six when the maleness factor kicks in. So, and also female kind of evolved first from an evolutionary perspective, estrogen was the first hormone to evolve. So there's, there's lots of beneficial things going on with um, the female body that is, so I think just reframing it that way has been yeah, it's been good to see. I think women respond to that. So it becomes a message of celebrating what the body itself rather than like being negative, you know, about the pill. It, it, they're sort of two sides of the same thing. So if you can't really talk about the benefits of ovulation and the benefits of hormones without then acknowledging that these hormone suppressing drugs are potentially a problem. Right. No, I, no, I completely hear you. And, and it's, it, I do encourage women to just continue understanding how all the hormones and how our bodies work and why, because it, it is amazing. And it is incredible to see the signs and symptoms that we have. Like right now for the past two weeks, I've had a lot of headaches. Now it could be because my kid is starting school and the school system can't make a decision on when school is starting, but I'm pretty sure it's also hormonally related. But I know that because I've been doing you know, the podcast, I've been studying women's health for a decade. Like I, I now know, like I probably should get the hormones checked and see which one's off. How old are you? I mean, I'm you uh, 46. Yeah. Okay. So my next book. I know. I'm so excited. Tell me, tell me. So I wrote a book on, about perimenopause, which is our forties, basically. It's all, it's all our forties. I mean, pretty much if you're 40 something, you're in perimenopause almost right. by definition. It's a pretty interesting time too. And I'm very passionate and excited about some things about perimenopause that I've, again, once again, feel like are not being kind of discussed in the right way. So one of the main things, just in a nutshell, like one of the big things that happens in perimenopause to all of us is project, the hormone progesterone <laughs> goes. <laughs> it's like it's, it, 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 it leaves the stage. Not completely, but it really does start to go down. And it's nothing you're doing wrong. Like, you know, I, I think you could try to keep it going as long as you can and be as healthy as you can, but it, that's just the nature of the, it's second puberty. So right. in first puberty, estrogen comes first, loads of it usually. And then progesterone doesn't kick in for a couple of years. That's why young girl, like 13 year old girls can have quite heavy periods and irregular periods. It's like, there's no progesterone yet to exert its 
period lightning kind of calming effect, then it, in a mirror image of first puberty, we get second puberty where estrogen goes crazy, <laughs> higher than ever before, and progesterone just slowly drops away. Yeah. And that can feel, that can manifest in different symptoms, which of course I've written a whole book about, which I'm yes. excited about. When is it coming yeah. out, by the way? March. Okay. I, I will definitely um, mark my calendar and read yeah. it. One of the things you were just talking about with reminded me of another point in your book that I, I've always wanted to ask you, and I, I had kind of forgotten about it until you brought this up, which is about how the period evolves in a woman. So you were talking about how it takes a little while for the period to normalize when a yep. young woman first gets it. It seems like when the girls are young and they're having that heavy bleed, a lot of people put them on the pill. I know. And is it because the doctors aren't patient enough to wait for the period to evolve to where it's supposed to get? Like, is this happening? <laughs> this is happening. Girls are being put on the pill very young. Now, oh to be fair, no one likes to see an 11-year-old girl bleeding through her sheets at night. Right. Like, you know, ugh, like you know, I've had some young women in my life. I know it's, it's distressing. Like, so that definitely you want to help them. You don't want you, I mean, so fortunately, which is in the book and I have a blog post about it, there are ways to lighten the periods of young yes. girls that don't involve the pill. Like that you can help them. It's not a question of just leaving them to it. And, but also, yes, so there is this other element of understanding that the menstrual cycle has to mature. And that takes well it takes usually it takes a, a year or two for progesterone to start to kick in so most girls aren't going to have to go through that heavy period phase for too long right but bigger picture in terms of properly maturing like um gaining what's called a robust menstrual cycle one that is not going to be pushed around by too much by stress or under eating like you know it keeps going is takes 12 years that's according to again professor Pryor, endocrinologist who helped me with my book she has a a stat, which I've, I cited in the book, so you can find the reference there, that it takes 12 years. So if you get your period at 13, it's not till you're 25 that you're in all your progesterone, like robustness, right? Like you're really doing it by 25, your, your peak fertility probably around that time um, in terms of progesterone production. There are other factors in fertility as well. But the interesting thing is if you interrupt that by switching off the menstrual cycle with contraceptive drugs, you that maturation process can't happen which is why you then get women coming off the pill in their early 30s and can't immediately get a regular menstrual cycle look they get there you should get there eventually but you know it's so when i'm working with patients just understanding this process of maturation of the menstrual cycle one of my first questions would be so if they're trying to come off the pill in their 30s say and the thing i need to know more than anything else is did you have any years of natural cycling? Like, did you have, I'm thinking like, did you have any chance opportunity to mature your menstrual cycle? Cause my experience is even if they had even a couple of years, even like even better, like three or four years, if they didn't go on the pill to like 15 or 16 or 17 or something like that. And they had some semi-regular cycles before that. Then I say to my patient, you're going to be okay. Like, I think it's going to be okay. Like your body it's going to remember how to do that. You had an opportunity okay. to do that. I think in the book, this is all in chapter one of period repair manual. I talk about the hormonal rivers. It's yep. an analogy. I've had some people like that analogy. Just yes. it's your, it's the hormones learning what they're supposed to do. Um, yeah. And so so it's if, if yeah. you don't have that, it's a little bit hard. It's harder for the hormones. It's just harder. It just, yep. it just takes time. And it, it can be, it can mean you're more, for example, the best example is under eating. So young women, so under eating can cause women to lose their period, especially if they're young or especially if they don't have a you know, menstrual cycle that's really sort of matured. It's, and it's, severe under eating will always shut down periods regardless, but like, you know, mild or under eating or milder stress is going to be more of a problem for women who don't have a robust, mature menstrual cycle. Okay. Got it. Yeah. And then. As far as, and maybe with the five years of people being more comfortable talking about periods and more conversations happening, people still get it. But just in case there's still questions out there, tell us about a normal period. And here's okay. why I asked this question. These 
um, fertility tracking apps, because that's what they're calling them, um, they will ask, is your period heavy, medium, or light? Right. <laughs> yeah. And um, I was talking to somebody and they brought up a really good point, which is, what does that mean? And like, as an example, like as a woman, because remember the app is just an app. You enter the data and it has yeah. to calculate. But to the woman, are we all defining this the same way? So as an example, does the woman compare heavy, medium, light between day one? And if there's a five day cycle, day five, is it between day one of I hear you. this cycle versus the previous cycle? So can you educate women properly yeah. on like what, cause we aren't taught this. We're just told you get this and we're it, even told it's terrible. <laughs> it's very subjective. It is like, I've had interesting conversations cause I get to ask, I've asked thousands of women about their periods. So I get to, and I ask how much and right. we try to quantify it, which I talk about in a minute. So I get to hear women say, Oh yeah, my periods are pretty heavy. Oh, I've, meaning I fill, have filled two regular tampons in a day kind of thing. I'm like, okay, actually that's not that heavy. Or I get women who are like, Oh, I'm like overflowing my menstrual cup three times a day, but it's not that bad. <laughs> like, yeah, that's heavy. So <laughs> like the range of normal. So I, I mean, cause I'm Canadian, New Zealand, I'm talking milliliters, but that's so okay. 25 between sort of, I'd say it can be quite, quite light as normal. So it can be as little as say 15 or 25 milliliters, which is really just a few, tab- a few teaspoons over all the days of the period or anywhere up to 80 milliliters, which is, several tablespoons over all the days of the period. The period shouldn't be more than seven days. That's the, that's the other parameter. Like a proper ovulatory cycle shouldn't be more than six or seven days. If it's longer than that, something's wrong. Right. So 80 milliliters is actually not that much. It's not uncommon to be fair to have heavier than that. So, and in fact, during perimenopause, the crazy heavy periods of per- that some women get during perimenopause, it can be like not 80 milliliters, but like, 500. So, you know, you get a sense of the scale of things. Like some women might lose like a couple cups, which is, you know, a lot. Like, so that's, wow. those are the women who end up having, well, they used to give them hysterectomies. When I started practicing, like uterus removal was what happened for that situation. But now it's hormonal IUD usually, which is, I would argue better than a hysterectomy. Yes. So, I but younger women- argue the same thing. <laughs> yeah. Most younger women aren't going to get like 500 milliliters. Like they're probably, you know, women in her twenties, thirties might be up and if she's having an ovulatory cycle, when, she could maybe be up for like around 100, 120 milliliters. So in the book, in period repair manual, and not just there, but lots of places you can yeah. find how you calculate that. So like a regular full tampon, a full, a regular tampon filled is about five milliliters. A super tampon is about 10. If you use a menstrual cup, it's a lot easier because you could actually just look at how much, you know, the cup holds 20. So you kind of roughly have filled it. So it's like 10, you, you can start to tally up, figure out how heavy it is. And of course the problem, the real problem with heavy periods, apart from being very annoying is iron because it depletes yep. women of iron. So it's not a small problem, like a heavy period, it, depending on how heavy it can be quite depleting to health and being iron deficient is not good for immune function or causes hair loss and yeah, all sorts of things. So. No, absolutely. Now, I'm curious, tampon versus pad versus the menstrual cup. Are there any, I mean, outside of tampons, obviously making sure that they're 100% cotton and organic, anything that, like any specific preferences or concerns that women should have about either of those options? I think they're all f- okay. As you say, like, I think if you're going to be inserting something, I think it should be an organic cotton, not have little yep. bits of nylon fiber or <laughs> uh, like dioxins, which they don't have anymore. But, um, but I, I, I personally prefer menstrual cups. I just, I think they're more comfortable. I mean, this is, I, but I don't insist that everyone has to use a menstrual cup. No, I think it's at least worth kind of knowing that they're out there and that they're actually pretty easy to use and environmentally friendly. So, okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. thank you. I just didn't know if there was like a, cause I know that there's um, it's wonderful that the menstrual cups are really becoming such so much more yeah. commonplace. So go ahead. No, just for what, for what it's worth, they do seem for women with very heavy periods, the menstrual cups do seem like a better option. I don't, you know, some women claim they lighten periods. I don't know a mechanism how that would happen, but I think maybe it's just, they hold more and Got you it. can kind of get, keep better control over what's going on with a menstrual cup. 
Okay. No, that's very helpful. Yeah. Anything else that you want to make sure on national period day that women right. know, because, you know, we've talked about so many great topics about, it's not just the period. It's really about ovulation. And that's, yeah. that's what this is all about. Um, and just helpful information about the birth control as well. Anything else that women should know a top line before they read the rest yeah. of your book for all the details. Okay. Severe period pain is never, ever normal. Never, okay. never, never, never normal. So I differentiate as do many other people between in my book, I talk about severe pain, like normal, well, so-called normal period pain versus severe period pain. I would argue pain is never normal. Any amount of pain is really not normal, but it's common to get a little bit of cramping. You can take a ibuprofen and it goes away. And that's, you know, that's nothing sinister is going on. That's just sort of a, a normal situation. If you're curled up in a ball, and can't go to school and, you know, are crying and vomiting and that's, there's something going on and that something can be endometriosis. So it really is worth mentioning at this point, that specific condition, which we could do a whole podcast on one time, but it's, oh, about, one in t- it's about one in 10 women yep. and girls. And it usually hits quite young. And unfortunately, as you probably know, it can be undiagnosed for years yeah. and especially cause it often runs in families. So then you'd have girls being told by their mother, like our older, you know, aunties is like, well, this is just how it is. This is what periods are like. And so the activism around endometriosis is to, to explain, no, this is not a normal situation. And then of course, then there's the next question of how do you treat it? And that's a whole other Oh yeah. Well, yeah. Like, we did interview, I interviewed Dr. Tamara Suchkin who did my endometriosis surgery. Okay. And yeah. um, we, it's, it's a quite a popular podcast. Okay, <laughs> so good. definitely a link topic. to that one. Yes. Yeah. Definitely a topic that needs to be discussed further because, and I appreciate what you're saying about the, the period pain because we women grin and bear it. And so when you were saying pain, I'm like, I hope you describe it in great detail because yeah we women are like, this is how it is. And the, the moms and grandmothers and aunties are like, this is how it is. And it's, I know. it's not the case. So my experience, I'll just share, because of course I've had the opportunity and I'm very grateful for that. of just hearing the stories, like speaking to thousands of women over the years. I don't personally have endometriosis, but I've had many, like hundreds, if not thousands of women who do, patients who do, and then patients who don't. And I can tell you, I think women who don't have endometriosis have no idea of what pain is is, you know, like, but I mean, like, I sort of feel like the pain that women with endometriosis put up with is so off the scale compared to what other people think would be acceptable that it's, um, yeah, it's just quite interesting to see that perspective that it's, um, it's pain at another level usually, although it can be, can be milder pain and still be worth treating, but yeah, the pain can be, and it shouldn't be like that. No, I know. I know. And I'm so glad you're saying this. And, and for those of you who do struggle, like what would be your words of wisdom to the women who are in severe pain and aren't being heard? What would you say to them? I mean, you're a little girl in a lot of pain and everyone's like, it's fine. This is how it is. I just say it's not normal. We're going to, we're going to try to get you some help. Um, then there's a question. I mean, it's so, there's so many aspects to this, which I'm sure you spoke about on your other podcast, but like it's at finding the right special, like, I do feel like girls with endometriosis need to be under the care of a gynecologist who knows about endometriosis and who, you know, is going to be able to assess it properly. There's a new, there's on the, on the radar now, we can put in the show notes if you want. As you know, there's probably, they're working on different non-invasive methods of diagnosis, but there's a couple of Australian surgeons, Matthew Leonardi, I think it's what I follow him on Twitter. I've sort of, you know, they've done a couple of scientific papers recently about Ultra, using ultrasound to diagnose. So as you know, like a normally done ultrasound cannot pick right. up endometriosis. So, but you, there's a specialized way, like you, you can, if people who know what they're doing can use ultrasound in a way where they can sometimes pick it up. So to me, that's a positive development. It just means, Great. yep, there might just be more information, more without having to make that rather daunting decision of, okay, the very, the very first step is surgery. Cause that's hard. Yeah. Like it's hard for <laughs> anyone to do. Yeah. No, absolutely. So what is your greatest hope for women's health? Yeah, I guess that we have a greater, we collectively have a greater understanding of how the menstrual cycle works and the benefits of hormones. This is more than one thing, but also I would really like to see new methods of birth control come down the pipeline. Like 
like just completely thinking outside the box, different ways of avoiding pregnancy, of which there's a couple coming, which you probably know is one called vasal gel. There's a couple of male ones coming, but I just, I feel like the burden of birth control and particularly hormonal birth control has been on women for too long. And I just, we get locked into this conversation about access to hormonal birth control. It's like, okay, fine, but it is 2020. Like, I think we could have access to some other types of avoiding pregnancy. It shouldn't require, you know, avoiding pregnancy shouldn't require shutting down the entire hormonal system of a girl. Like it's just shouldn't like we have the technology surely. So, and unfortunately there isn't, as you know, there's not a lot of research. There's not a lot of funding. Like the basal gel, it's a male method, a Mm non-hormonal method. I don't know if you know this, but they've, to get it into clinical trials, they had to crowdfund. They had to do like a, a, a Kickstarter kind of thing <laughs> because no pharmaceutical company re- wants anything to do with it. They're actually not interested. I guess it's not profitable for them to come up with new technology for birth control. So we're, it's going to have to happen in the crowdfunding space, I would think. Oh my goodness. Lots needs to be transformed. Well, thank yeah. you for your time. It's been yes. a pleasure to get to know you and uh, please keep doing what you're doing. We need you. Thank you for writing and thank you for now writing your next book in March about uh, perimenopause. I look forward to reading it. Thanks, Georgie. Thank you for tuning in to this discussion on the FemPower Health podcast. You can refer to the show notes for links to information that is referred to in this episode. And if you like this episode and found it timely and valuable, please take a moment to tell a friend or a colleague about FemPower Health. And right after this episode is over, please think of one person who might find this episode helpful and tell them about it. And if your friend is new to podcasting, please show them how to subscribe to our show. And another way to support FemPower Health Podcast is to leave a review where you listen to podcasts. And as a reminder, the information shared by FemPower Health is not medical advice, but for information purposes to enable you to have more effective conversations with your doctor. Always talk to your doctor before making health-related decisions. Additionally, the views expressed by the FemPower Health podcast guests are their own, and their appearance on the program does not imply an endorsement of them or any entity they represent. See you next week. Thank you for joining us on another enlightening episode of FemPower Health. No matter where you are in your journey, our website is brimming with content tailored to your specific topic of interest or life stage. Dive in and discover the resources and insights waiting for you. Your voice matters to us. And if you found value in this episode, please take a moment to write a review. Your feedback not only helps us improve, but it also helps others discover our podcast. By spreading the word, you're empowering women everywhere with the information they need to navigate their unique health journeys. And if this episode resonated with you, please don't keep it a secret. Share it with friends, loved ones, or anyone you believe would benefit from the information. Together, we can create a world where every woman feels supported, informed, and empowered. Remember, knowledge is power, and FemPower Health is here to guide you and support you in every step of the way. And as a reminder, the information shared by FemPower Health is not medical advice, but for informational purposes to enable you to have more effective conversations with your doctor. Always talk to your doctor before making health-related decisions. Additionally, the views expressed by the FemPower Health podcast guests are their own, and their appearance on the program does not imply an endorsement of them or any entity they represent. Until next time.